LinkedIn is firstly a business networking site. It's a business networking site. So prospecting is not networking. Hello, afternoon everybody, it's Richard from DME and welcome to the November episode of the Ask DME show. Yes, episode nine and it's the finale of the year, the last show of the year and we've got a real cracking show ahead of us. Now, if you're new to the show, the whole concept of these when we started them back in February was really to answer people's questions and just give you things to talk about every month that were really focused on your business growth. So if you're looking to grow a seven-figure business or you work in the business-to-business -business, uh, environment, then we wanted to give real value through those shows and also ask, allow people to ask questions about that. So everything from developing a growth strategy through how to generate traffic and leads, convert that traffic and those traffic and leads into um into leads in your CRM and then how to nurture those leads and right the way through to customer success at the end. Uh, and then obviously tying all of that together with a system and processes um, that kept it really structured and predictable, your business growth. So that's really what the shows have been aimed at. Um, again, this show has been fantastically um supported with questions we've had 15 odd questions i think coming uh for austin today and it's going to be focused really intensely on the sales process and how we convert those nurture relationships with our leads move them naturally along until we convert them into a client or revenue for the business so again the whole focus of this show is going to be around that and we're really lucky to have austin hempstead one of the top sales trainers in the uk who truly believes that selling is a skill that you can learn so a bit of context around this i think Anyone who's seen me speak in some of our live workshops or been on the show will have seen that I very much emphasize the importance of getting conversion right and focusing on your conversion at every stage of your process before adding volume to it. Um, and the two conversion points I always focus in on are how effective are we at converting website traffic that's coming into our website into leads in our CRM? And then once they are a lead in the CRM, do we have a predictable sales process that those leads go through? So at each point, we can measure the conversion percentage of um, as they move through. And that's really important. That sales conversion is so important in modern business growth. But it's also really predictable. You know, it's not something that should be left to chance. It's something that's very, very predictable. And that's why we felt it was important that we had someone uh, of Austin standing come in and talk to us about that process from his point of view as someone who's trained hundreds of salespeople over the year on sales companies uh, to give that insight into that so you can take it away today take some of these things away and put them into action in your business all right so before i talk any more let's bring austin into the show and meet austin morning M morning austin Sorry, can we just that's it? How are you doing, mate? You're right. I'm good. I'm good. Looking forward to looking forward to the chat. Yeah, we certainly had plenty of questions come in, didn't we? When we were going through them yesterday, trying to pick five or six to focus on first was a was a challenge. Yeah, so. Indeed. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know you, Austin, just give a bit of uh, background on you and how you got into sales and some of the history and uh, where you are now as well. Okay. Uh, well. I've, I've been in sales since I, since I was 20. I went self-employed into selling with the confidence that usually comes with being 20 and arrogant, um, thinking that I'd be a great salesperson. And uh, I found selling to be extremely tough, far, far tougher than I imagined it would be. Um, ultimately, after five years, I started my sole trader, if you like, into having a sales team and then built my first sales business in the UK. Sold that ultimately after about 16 years and then started another business in the Middle East and expanded that in Asia, in Singapore, China, places like that. Um, and built another sales business and, and sold that. Um, and then I achieved one of my goals that I set very early in the sales career, of being able to retire when I was 50. And I retired when I was 49. But after a couple of years, I was bored. Um, I missed selling. I really missed selling and the buzz and the excitement. Um, so I started 
this business, uh, sales training. I thought that's the thing I enjoyed doing the most when I was building my companies. That's where I think I bring the most value. So yeah. I started this and yeah, great fun. I love doing it. And you moved back to Lincolnshire, I take it, or you moved to Lincolnshire. You're not originally from Lincolnshire. Are you? No, not from Lincolnshire at all. But yeah, we moved to Lincolnshire a few years ago, a few years after actually started having started this business, actually. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we, we enjoy living in Lincolnshire. We've always liked living semi-rurally, um, although I was born and raised in a town um, on the west coast of England. But semi-rural living for me is, 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 is glorious. I look out there now and I can see trees and blue sky. It's a beautiful morning. <laughs> Fabulous. Right, well, let's crack on with the questions then, Austin. Um, I know you've got a few things you like to say before the questions. Yeah, I've got four caveats um, that I'd just like to mention be, before answering them. And, and the, the first one is selling is a skill. Um, and whilst I might be able to give an answer uh, to the, the question, a, a method, a solution, a technique, um, the effectiveness of it will primarily come down to how skilled the person is at applying that solution, that method, that whatever, okay? It depends on their selling skills for the most part as to how effective it is. The second caveat is that most people in sales, and I include business owners in this, and I, I know there's a lot of business owners on, on your on this today, as it were, um, and so I don't, I don't want to be rude, but most people in sales, including business owners, maybe even especially business owners, massively, overestimate their selling skills right um thirdly selling is not easy i don't think selling is easy i'm not going to try and convince anyone's e it's easy i think selling is really tough um so if you hear me provide an answer to a question and you think well that's an easy fix you've misunderstood the answer to the question uh, because any of the things that we talk about are easy to talk about yeah but they're not easy to do effectively because, hey, um, and I think the, the fact that it's a skill is it's that one fundamental fact that most people fail to recognize. And it's one of the reasons why there's so much mediocrity in selling generally. Mm. And my fourth and last caveat is that nothing works. Whatever <laughs> ideas I share with you, they all have the capacity not to work. Again, because you've got to get good at using them or applying them and so on and so forth. So they all have that ability. So don't use an idea once or twice. Uh, and then, well, does it work? You've got to stick with it and, and, and make it work. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's the four caveats. I hear a lot from business people that I speak to that, oh, I'm not good at selling. Do you think that's just uh, something they're convincing themselves of? Or um, No, I think I, I think most people, and most people can sell. I think everybody can sell, but not sell in as much as most people can persuade, most people can convince, most people can influence. But when it comes to doing that for a living um, and where money starts to change hands, yeah, yeah. then th that, that's, that's, that's a very different way uh, and it adds a new dimension to it. So I, I, I can understand it. I think a lot of people are, are bad at selling and they're in, they're in a position where they – but what they don't do is they don't expose themselves to sales training and all the rest of it that, that could, could make such a massive difference to their ability. Yeah. Fabulous. Right. So let's bring in the questions. We've got quite a few to get through today. Um, and the first one that we uh, we had sent in was, what's the difference between a sales process and a sales pipeline? OK. Um, a sales process, how I look at it, it's the framework in which all the communications take place between a prospect and a seller. A sales pipeline only starts once the seller has been in contact with a prospect, qualified them. Um, in other words, they've they've talked to the prospect and the sellers decided there's a good chance of making a sale. And because of that, they, they decide to move the conversation forward to the next step. From that point, mm -hmm. now we're in the pipeline. We're still in the sales process as well. But it's in the pipeline. It's something that perhaps when the sales manager says, you know, what's in your pipeline? The salesperson might say, well, I've got this chat. I've seen him a couple of times and we're at the present station today. I'm going to be doing a demo next week. Um, so the sales process is the framework in which all the communications take place from 
the very first time you speak to them from the phone, if you, you know, if you if that initial contact is on a phone call, maybe it's networking. Um, but that's when that sales process starts from the very first contact. And then it goes through right the way through to the end and beyond closing the sale. Whereas the sales pipeline only kicks only kicks in, in my view, in my interpretation, the way I, I explain it, once it's been qualified as a potential sale, as a potential piece of business. Yeah, I agree. I think, when, you know, we use sales pipelines in HubSpot a lot and it's very much when it becomes a deal. So like a marketing qualified lead, we crass that as that then the sales side of the process kicks in and you're going to turn that into a, a sales opportunity and then uh, obviously close uh, move them along that pipeline uh, to hopefully closed one or closed lost. I mean, that should be your two options at the end, I think. So, yeah, very interesting. I like that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And do you use um, do you use software and technology now, or do you think that has enhanced the ability to to manage pipelines, or is it uh, again? Do you like the old fashioned way of just keeping everything very simple? Um, for me, I keep things simple. If I'm running, if I was running a sales team, I'd use technology and have a a, a CRM. Um, mm -hmm. The CRMs are really, really useful in in helping sales and in, increase sales. Uh, and repeat sales and cross sales. The, the, the trick, the key is getting salespeople, of course, to use it properly um, because <laughs> most of them don't want to. But again, to a large extent, my experience is it's that it is the salesperson has never been sold, if you will, as to how useful, how valuable this CRM system is. And indeed, a lot of sales managers that I found, sales directors, people running sales teams, they use the CRM to hit people over the head, as it were, with yeah. what they haven't done, as opposed to using it as a primarily a tool to help create sales and help the salesperson upsell, cross-sell, and even, indeed even get more sales. So, yeah, I think CRMs are often misused by people running sales teams. It's, it should be used as a, as a primarily as a, as a thing to help sales, not hit people over the head with a stick because it, it's still in the pipeline. If something has been in the pipeline too long, um, hitting people over the head with a stick isn't the way to way to fix it. No, no, absolutely. Right, let's move on to question two then. Um, so question two was, I'm wasting a lot of time uh, chasing people or talking to people who are not interested. Am I not qualifying correctly? Uh, bottom line, yeah, you're not... <laughs> You're not qualifying. Yes, you're not qualifying correctly. Um, but there's, there's probably more to it than that. But yes, you're probably not qualifying correctly. And closely entwined with that is that you're probably also, as I call it, you're probably selling to success in the sales conversation. Um, yeah. Qualifying people is a sales skill. It's one that needs to be applied throughout the sales process. Um, I mean, for example, let me use my flip chart. I like, I'm, I'm, I'm an old-fashioned guy in that sense. I like my flip charts. Okay. Um, so, selling too soon. Let, let, let me let, let, let's relate it back to sport. Can I? You can see, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, so this is some kind of sports pitch. It doesn't matter what, whether it's a hockey pitch or a football pitch or whatever kind of pitch. And if if we're attacking this goal, if you like, we're going to score up here. If we take a shot from here then our chances of scoring are very, very limited. We've, you know, you know, maybe, maybe one in 100. The, the problem can be that sometimes in sales, if this is our sales process, if this, if this represents the sales process, the problem is if we take a shot in sales and go for the, the sale too early, occasionally, really occasionally, we actually score. And we think, wow, that's the way to do it. That's what I should be doing because I've got, I've scored, I've got the goal, as it were, made the sale. Yeah. Um, but they don't realize necessarily, well, yeah, but that, that was a one in a hundred shot. That you, you, you do that every time, the chances are you're going to fail because by the time you've done another 99, you, you, you know, you, you're getting five areas to get yourself in this position here and take shots from there because then it makes it look. Well, it, it then becomes so much more simpler to score. The and and that's it again. As I said at the beginning, that's easy for me to say, but being there takes skill. Okay, whether we're doing sports or in the sales process, you know that takes um, uh, being a, that takes timing. It takes uh, 
judgment in terms of get, make, making sure you're in that position at the right time, that you don't take too long to get there, that you don't take you don't get there too quickly, um, that you're you, you're calm because just like someone taking a shot at goal when you when you're trying to close the sale, you're presenting, you're demoing, you know you're under a certain amount of pressure maybe. So there's an awful lot of skills. So it's easy to say, well, just get yourself in that position. But we all know that being in that position in sport can take an awful lot of skill and preparation, stuff that has to happen even before you step on the pitch. And selling is exactly the same. Even before you step into the sales process with this prospect, there's an awful lot of things that you could have done that will help make sure you end up in that position. Yep. And that if you don't do them, getting in that position is an awful lot harder. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll add to that as well. And that selling is a team skill and you have a marketing team. Usually in most companies, there should be some marketing activity going on that's generating leads. I know hard and direct sales, you probably your salesperson does everything. But I think in modern companies that are growing, you will have form, some form of marketing team or a, a marketing activity going on that can make life easier so if you're thinking of your analogy there austin i would say your sales team are in the top half of the pitch they're your midfielders and strikers but then you convert your actual marketing team other people are identifying good opportunities constantly for them yeah great that's a great way of looking at it absolutely uh, yeah it's something we talk about sales enablement where marketing and sales aren't really two separate silos anymore they're very much mm. together you know we call yeah. it marketing no absolutely and if i can just give one one tip, um, and, and again, it's not necessary. It's, it's easy for me to say it, um, but what I'm about to tell you will not be as effective as a standalone solution. I mean, it's got to be part of a, 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 a an effective sales conversation. But one of the triggers before you try and take a shot, before you do your demo, before you do your presentation, before you start to pitch, one of the triggers needs to be that your prospect has told you your prospect has told you how your product or service will help them or how important it is or how valuable it is don't pitch don't yeah. present don't demo don't do those things until the prospect is telling you those kind of things perfect i love that okay that's brilliant so yes to answer that question you you most of the time you'll be wasting time because i think there's not you've not identified a good fit prospect to be going after in the first place so we have a, what's called a good fit matrix where we have all our leads go through it and we identify the ones that we really should be spending our time talking to and then the ones that marketing need to nurture more till they're at the stage where we talk to them and then there's the other ones who you know it's no point spending your time talking to them. They're probably going to buy it a long way in the future or they're not actively in that buying cycle. So again, I, I go back to if you're talking every day to good fit people, you you up your chance again. It's that being in the top half of the pitch. Yeah, you're right, Richard. You've got to be talking to those good fit. And, the, and again, most companies I find of all, all kinds of sizes are really bad at focusing on the good yeah. fit people because yeah. they don't put it that they can sell to... A, a, an awful lot of people they try and sell to an awful lot of people yeah and it's just less effective it just yeah. isn't as effective and you know what, what we need to be doing is selling to the people who need it most and yeah. or will benefit most from it don't you know yeah. and businesses need to think about that who needs this most who benefit most because the right. says they're most likely to buy it um, yeah. it's just good business sense and they give very very they give very specific signals to show that they are interested. I think the content they consume on your website, all of these things now using technology again, it is going to give you a real context around your conversations with people. You'll yeah, that's right. They're engaging Absolutely. with, you know, and that'll tell them. So I love so that. The so the conversation, conversation, you're talking to those kind of people, if you, and again, it sounds easy, but it's not. You've got to put the time and the effort and the work into making sure you're talking to those kind of people. But yeah, once exactly. you're then on the pitch, if you like, and those are the people you're talking to, the conversation you have is so much more fun and yeah. interesting and valuable rather than having a conversation that's a battle, yeah. trying yeah. to convince this person that maybe they should be buying your product. Yeah, yeah. Help them make the right decision. I think it's a great, a great way of uh, thinking about it, whether that decision is to use you or not. Actually, if you've made people 
help yeah. people all the way along to make the right decision for them, it should naturally fall your way. I think we we naturally gravitate towards using someone who's been the most helpful, don't we, through our journey? So, no, absolutely. That. So let's move uh, on to technology a little bit or social media. And obviously okay. we're on LinkedIn at the moment with the live show. Um, and a lot of salespeople have jumped on the bandwagon of using LinkedIn for prospecting. And the question very much was around that. How do I use LinkedIn for prospecting without upsetting people? No one seems to connect with me because I'm in sales. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK. <laughs> Right. Uh, now I'm going to upset a few people now, probably, and people think, well, you're in La La Land. I said, that's fine. Um, I just want you to know that I've realised that I might do that. Um, first of all, I'm in sales. <laughs> um, people connect with me. But 95% of my LinkedIn activity is not prospecting. Um, my second biggest source of business is networking, be that online networking through LinkedIn or face-to-face. -face. That's my second biggest source of business. LinkedIn is firstly a business networking site. It's a business networking site. So prospecting is not networking. There is nothing wrong with prospecting and there's nothing wrong with networking, but they're not the same. And today, so many people have merged them into one. Now, I know a lot of people will argue the point and say, well, no, no, networking is a form of prospecting. Well, well, not the way I believe networking is done. It's not. In fact, when I'm networking, there's nothing I hate more than people trying to prospect me, particularly when that's face to face. And I, I only have to read comments on LinkedIn to know that being prospected on LinkedIn <laughs> drives people up the wall. So you've got to understand this prospecting is so important in selling. But prospecting is not networking. So you've got to make sure you understand what networking is. Because if you think networking is prospecting, in my view, you're going to have hard times. You're going to do it wrong. And people are not going to connect with you. I fully understand why people don't want to connect with you. Because, frankly, <laughs> I probably would want to connect with you uh, if you're always selling, as it were. Um so what, what do you do? Well, well, you earn the right once you have been networking, once you've networked with a person, and this might take, it will almost certainly take time. And again, I always think of it, try to help people picture it in the way, if I'm trying to get people to picture it how I see it, if I, pick, if, if I meet someone at a face-to-face -face networking event and they try and pitch me, there's like the, the chances of them succeeding are very, very small. Yeah. But... If over a period of time they get to know me and they get to understand what my business is and so on and so forth, then I'm far more likely to be receptive to sit down and listen to them and what they have to say about whatever it is they're selling. And in my view, networking online with LinkedIn is exactly the same as that. So it's it tends to be a slow burner. If you want if you want quick results in terms of prospecting, pick yeah. the phone, just call call people. I'm not saying. In cold calling is the best way. Cold calling works. You know, I don't care whether people like it, hate it, or, or love it, whatever. Cold calling works. Period. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want quick results, just pick the phone up and cold call people. Yeah. Um, but LinkedIn, you need to network them. How do you do that? You are by engaging with these people, by engaging with their posts, by asking them questions about their posts, by being genuinely interested in the content that they put, that they put on, whether it's their own post or whether it's comments they make engage with them again think about it face to face you, you know get try and get to know them and then after a period of time and that time may be a month it might be two months three months then perhaps it's worth picking the phone up because you've hopefully now got some kind of a relationship with that person they kind of got to know you a little bit because maybe they've uh, followed your content as well they're certainly more like they're likely to uh, like you more than they did um, because of all this engagement that you've been involved with on their content. So yeah. that's how you, in my view, earn the right to pick a phone up and try and talk to someone that you're connected with. You network first. You give first. You promote their posts first. You engage with their posts. And in my view, that's giving because you're every time you're engaging with their content, you're helping promote it across your network um, and then, therefore, the person is far, far more likely to be receptive to the idea of talking to you uh, when you've taken the time to when you invested all that time and effort in engaging with them. Yeah. And if you want to read a book on doing this really well, read Social Selling Mastery by uh, Jamie Shanks. That is just 
the absolute bible on how to do this properly uh, he has about making your profile very biocentric so it's talking about them not you um, and then he has this feed approach which is find ed educate engage and develop and he says that is the way to do it and and we did it very in dme we switched totally from connecting with people to just engaging and then after we'd engage with someone three or four times then we would say oh by the way i've sent you a connection request and it, it works every time you're spot on with that engagement is the key um, and yes you can have your list and say this is the people i need to engage with and connect with but if you do it as a long-term thing and every day you have a cadence of half an hour 45 minutes every morning doing this which is how i did it so over the years i've just put 90 minutes aside to start with and then it dropped down to 45 minutes but every day it was commenting on people's posts it was engaging sharing the posts and just yeah you know, absolutely yeah it's you're working at it and again it's that stuff that you're doing before you get on the pitch as it were you're you know you're working at it whereas sales people just want it, want it now want it quick want it now 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 You've yeah. got to be prepared to invest time and effort into it. Of course, yeah. No one's on there to be sold to, are they? So let's be, let's be honest. No, so, no they are. These people that send direct message after direct message that just sell, sell, sell. Me, me, me. This is what my company does. You, think, you haven't even asked about me yet. No, again, and again, it's it's like, you know, it's, it's, they're taking the shot from here. The danger is, that the, you know, the first time they ever do it, somebody actually bites <laughs> and they think, oh, right, that's what you do. This um, works. But, that's right yeah it's that old expression isn't it you know a broken clock's right twice a day you know it's <laughs> it is. no no it's really true and uh i'm glad someone sent the question in because it's uh it's one of my big bugbears i've even got a standard response that i send to people saying this isn't working and then giving them tips on how to do it right. yeah. it just annoyed me so much and i thought the sales people out there are obviously being taught this somewhere Somewhere yeah. someone say this works um, or use this. No, software. that's right. You think why? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So brilliant. Um, so let's move on to question four then. Um, how can I help my sales team follow our process despite the temptation to do otherwise if an opportunity appears ready to move quicker? So I think it's this making sure you go through that process rather than trying to jump to the end game straight away. I think that's what they're trying to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it's, 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 it's inherent. First of all, we've got to understand the, the, the salesperson, the, the, the animal that is the salesperson, the, the, they're go getters, they're doers, they, you know, they try and make things happen. Good salespeople make things happen. Um, uh, but again, it's, a, it, it's a skill. So, Salespeople like quick and easy, okay? Mm -hmm. But quick and that bit like again, back, we're back to the LinkedIn thing, you know, connect and then let's do a pitch, you know, and yeah. let's make a let's make a sale as it were. They like quick and easy. So my my suggestion to the person who asked the question would be prove that using the sales process will 95% of the time be more effective, i.e., quick and easy, be more effective than using the quick and easy approach, if you will. So try and prove that to them. How could you do that? Well, if you're measuring, again, you can come back to your CRM. If you're measuring what people are doing and how they do it, then perhaps you can produce some stats and, and, and demonstrate uh, that the sales process is more effective and it will be 95% of the time. And be ready for that one <laughs> That the salesperson in your team says, "Oh, yeah, but I, you know, this this work because they'll all have one where it's worked um, yeah. by the quick and easy approach." You know, we we've all had those, um, but but by measuring, um, but also, and I'm not too sure how big the sales team is in this, and it will vary obviously from one business to another. But given that your sales process takes place over more than one appointment, investigate what the salesperson has discovered. Uh, about the prospect before allowing them to continue on to the next stage of the sales process. So have you know, have a chat with the salesperson when they come in and say, yeah, we've got something, you know, there's a potential sale here. This, the, the leader of the sales team, the sales manager, sales director needs to sit down and have a chat with that person who is always adopting the quick and easy approach and say, okay, great, this sounds great. Tell me what you know. And any sales manager, sales director worth their salt will then be able to discover if their salesperson knows enough to justify 
going to the next stage of the sales process. And if they don't know enough, then you send them back. Tell them, go back, have another chat. You, we need more than that because enough information. We don't know what the need is. We don't know what the problem is. We don't know what the impact is. We don't know anything about this. We don't know how, how what they see the value of this. If we can come up with a solution, will be. We don't even know what would, you know, what's going to stop them doing this because there's it's going to be something that will stop them doing this. Um, and yeah. what, what's the most likely thing if there is, you know, that will stop them doing it? That's the kind of information we need. And and sales managers, sales directors need to have that kind of conversation. And mm -hmm. the other thing you can do is highlight examples at every opportunity uh, of the quick and easy approach failing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, every chance you get, Mr. Sales Manager, Mr. Sales Director, any time that quick and easy approach has failed, one of your sales teams tried it and it hasn't worked, then highlight it um again and again and again and again and again and in the end the message will get through in the end yeah now as brilliant advice is that because uh, we always you know we talk about pain power fit scores and and that's again a, another example where you could come back and say you know if there's five five points for each what are they scoring out of 15 for a prospect yeah um, same. that's right i mean i can remember back in my when i first came into sales i remember I went out to see a chap. I can even remember his name. It was called Paul Lee Gate, and he lived in. I went to see him and uh, sat down with him. Within five minutes, he said, um, "Right, so you do pensions, right? You sell because I was an IFA." Yeah, I said, yeah. "You do pensions, right?" He said, yeah, yeah. He said, "Right, I want a pension." And I said, "Right, okay. How much do you want to put in it?" And he said, "I, can't wait. I think it was twenty pounds a month back then. Back in the day, when twenty pounds was more than it is now, twenty pounds a month." I said, "Okay, great." Um, so if so I said, right, okay, well, I'll, I'll go away and I'll come back in a couple of days and I'll, I'll, I'll have a pension for you for £20 a month. So two days later, I'm back, sat in front of him, sit down, explain it. So that's your £20 a month. And by the time you're 60, that's how much your pension pot will be worth. And 65 will be worth that if you decide to leave to a 65. And he said, uh, well, that's not good to me. And I said, I'm sorry? He said, well, that's not good to me. I said, well, what do you mean it's not good to you? He said, well, I want my money. I want to be able to get my money, get my hands on the money when I'm 50. Yeah. Now, back then in the 80s, you couldn't access a pension before you were 60. No, no. So because I hadn't followed the sales process, because I hadn't got the answers to the questions or the rest, because I didn't know he wanted access to his money when he was 50, yeah. I blew it. And he, you know, he thought, you're just trying to rip me off. You're trying to sell me a longer-term savings product than I actually need. <laughs> you know, yeah. So it, it's very easy to do. And it's so tempting when the prospect is saying to you yeah i want and they basically describe what you think is your product i want your product that you yeah. then just sell yeah and i think the other danger as well in that situation is that you may especially in business to business sales i think there's a we know that there's probably going to be five or six people involved in this decision there's not going to be just one person so you may have a champion in a company who's saying all the right things to you but again, if you haven't got the other people involved in the uh, buying committee, as we'd call it, we haven't got those people involved in the conversations, then, you know, the FD can pop up and say, hang on, I want to know this information. So, No, yeah. absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah, you've got to recognise who you're selling to. No, I'm, yeah. I'm, absolutely. Perfect. I do think, think to an, and it is, as you describe it, Richard, but I do think that today, because of the, of of the fact that there are these buying committees, there are more now than there ever were, that sellers can, though, sometimes make the mistake of just assuming that there is a buying committee and they make it, the sale harder than it needs yeah. to be. Yeah, I, I know myself, I've sold to FTSE 100 companies and dealt with one person, the sales director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, as, as big as that, um, and equally smaller companies and just spoke to the MD or and, and, and it was just one person. Most of the time I find that, at least in my world, and I'm selling often to big companies, Yeah, I get to, if I get to the right person, there doesn't necessarily have to be a, a buying committee. But you're right, there are, there's more than there ever were. Yeah, we have it at the end of our 15 minute connect call with anybody. We have a, before we even go to an hour long exploratory, we have the question, um, is there anybody else who we need to involve in this discussion? You know, and that's yeah. sort of, oh, no, no, it's me. I'll, I'll be able to make the decision. And again, can you? <laughs> you don't know. You've got to, yeah, you got to, call. You got to test that yeah. out. Yeah, because everybody has to ask somebody else. So um, I, I, if I can, respectfully, I, 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 I'd rephrase your question ever so slightly if, if I might, yeah. might be so bold and, and, and just and say, who else who needs else? to be involved in yeah. this? 
It's a great shout. Yeah. 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 And as I say, it's, that, a, it's a skill, isn't it? It's just, it's just that's the importance of constantly, yeah, constantly looking at your sales process. I mean, we actually, after the exploratory call, we used to go straight to presentation once we'd got sort of all the detail out of it and we knew what was working and we'd sort of put together um, what we were going to talk to them about in the presentation, solution presentation. And then it was someone at HubSpot, uh, we were doing some of their sales training, and they said, always have a half hour goal setting and planning call in between the two, because you want to double check that what you've understood is exactly what they understand. Mm. And it was, it was such a game changer for us because it made those presentations worth doing, those, those hour and a half you were doing as your actual sales presentation. And all you were doing was really checking alignment. Right. A lot of the time, a salesperson's thought this, and the client, the client thought that, um, and they said that's that's. Yeah, you, you, you've heard something completely. Di- yeah, yeah, you've yeah. heard something different. Yeah, so with all good intentions, but you've heard, you've actually heard something different. That's right. Yeah. So that sales process again was just it underlined to us that extra step has made all the difference. Um, yeah, so. just to clarify it, just to yeah, it just is. To, yeah, yeah, it's yeah absolutely. Just these little things that can be so much help. It can, absolutely. Right, let's move on to question four, Austin. I'm just keeping yeah. an eye on the timer at 35 minutes already. Right. Right. A, couple more, right. a couple more questions to go through here. So okay. um, question five was revolving when prospects ask about a competitor's product or service and how yours compares, how do you approach that question? Okay. Um, first of all, and this I don't want this to sound egotistical at all, it's really not. First of all, I can't remember the last time I got the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I really don't remember, and and that's that in itself should be interesting to people who get the question a lot. Um, that I can't remember the last time, and I, the reason I believe that is is because I sell me and the value that I bring. Mm. Uh, okay. Um, as opposed to selling my service, I sell me and the value that I bring. I, you know, people always talk about people buy from people. And and, and I agree. It, it's right. But if that's true, if you believe that that is the case, that people buy from people, then you as the seller, whether you're a salesperson, business owner, you're the seller, you as the seller have got to try and be the best version of you that you can be because People buy from people. So why would you not try and be the best version of you that you can be? Um, so it's about you and the and the and, and the value that you bring. And secondly, I'm I'm very prepared to walk away from what I see as a um so in other words, I, I don't beg for the business. You know, I, I've got great belief that there's plenty of business out there, and I think sellers need to have that belief. So if it does, if it isn't right to make this sell, you, you know, you don't feel like you, you're under any pressure to try and m- make it happen. If you're quite prepared to 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 walk away, and I think that's really important to be prepared to walk away because somehow prospects, I think, pick that up. Mm-hmm. They can sense that you're not desperate. You don't need the business. Uh, and, and that helps draw people to you. You know what it's like. You get the sense that someone's desperate to make the sale. You start all kinds of questions come up in your mind. And, you know, why are they desperate to make? What's the yeah. problem with this product? Are they not selling much of it? Um, yeah. You know, so not appearing desperate is, is really important. Uh, and, and thirdly, I, I, I'm I'm able to, uh, and again, I can't remember when I last had to do it, but I can differentiate. I know how to differentiate me from what other people might perceive to be my competitors. And the fact that I know what I'm going to say and exactly how I'd say it, again, is important. I hope something that people listening will appreciate. So, yeah. for, I mean, for example, um, uh, I, the last time, I can't remember the last time it was said, but I would say something like, I, you know, if you another one other than me that you know, you like, that you trust, that has recruited and trained hundreds of salespeople, not only in the, in this country, but abroad as well, in the Middle East and Asia, that has over many years with thousands of prospects done all the sales tasks, mm-hmm. all the prospecting, all the cold calling, all the seminar selling, all the whatever, all the referral. Get, it, it done, they've done that with multinationalities in different parts of the world. 
And that sales trainer is not a career sales trainer, but brings real life experiences to your sales team. If you can get another sales trainer that brings all that, mm. and they're going to charge you less money than me, use yeah. them. Buy it from yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the um, anyone who's asking you that question, again, isn't understanding your value yet. And uh, and my, I'd always go back to, you're the one they're sat with. <laughs> so if they're sat with you, they're sat with you for a reason. There's an intent, there's an interest there. You know, and um, I think the, again, talking about content on your website, the things people have engaged with should have built trust and authority all the way through. That's right. If it's just a cold thing you're in and you it will always come down to price because there's no value in you. You know, and I think that, you know, when we're probably going to talk price in the next question, but again, it always, it's something that I think when someone hasn't got anything else to compare you against, then they'll always go to price. And that's absolutely, uh, absolutely always. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if they're asking about your competitors and we do have questions about trying to understand what their other plans are to get the solution they're trying to get. So we will we will touch on it without talking competitors. We'll say, you know, what are the things that you're looking at at the moment? What's been working? What hasn't been working? Um, and they'll often tell you, you know, you don't have to go in and talk to it. Yeah. You know? And that's, um, we, we had it recently actually with someone who was looking at three different systems as well as HubSpot. Um, but as soon as I talked to them about their experience with the others, it was, oh, we got sold to death by this company. They didn't listen to what we wanted, Richard. Duh, duh, duh. And then the next one was totally the opposite. We haven't heard from them since we first spoke to them. You know, so you knew straight away there was no real competition here. This was just words. So, so again, it was, um, yeah, it's very important to say not to, uh, to appreciate that people are in a consideration phase when they're coming up to making a decision. So they're probably looking at two or three options. Mm -hmm. But you should be head and shoulders yes. above everyone else by then anyway. So it, it shouldn't be a concern. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's go on to the final question. Um, just approaching 40 odd minutes. So uh, and it is price orientated. I know we don't like to go into it, but it's the reality that some people do seem to face in um in certain sales scenarios. Uh, people see us expensive and conversations always seem to come down down to price. How can I change this conversation? Okay, all right. Um, first of all, let's let's just deal with because they're they're the same, but they're ever so slightly different. Those two questions. People see us as expensive. Uh, how can I change? How can I change their mind? Um, my weakness is five star hotels. I like to stay in five star hotels. My favorite UK five star hotel is the Glen Eagles Hotel in Scotland. I play golf, by the way. I'm not a golfer at all. I've never played around a golf in my life, but I love the hotel. Um, and yet I could stay down the road at a place called the Glen Devon Hotel, which I think is a, it's either a three or four star hotel um, for a fraction of the price. I, I deliberately, before this uh, conversation, I was on the web this morning and on Sunday night, I think it's Sunday night this week, a standard room in the Glen Eagles Hotel for two people, £475. Uh, and in the Glen Devon, it was, I think it was £90 or so. It was, just two digits that was 90 pounds um so the five minutes apart um and fundamentally they provide the same thing um but one is charging an awful lot more uh and i can tell you now that the glen eagles hotel on the sunday night will be very very busy so uh, if people having a big price if you if you if you are expensive there's nothing wrong necessarily in being expensive um it's about the value that you attach to that product or to that service because I've been going to the Glen Eagles, Glen Eagles Hotel for years, and they've never said to me, oh, thanks for coming again. We'll give you a discount or something. You know, they, they, so it's, I always have to pay the full money in their restaurants and all the rest of it. Um, so don't get too down if you are expensive, because expensive isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, being cheap can be very detrimental. I mean, you know, you, know, you can might pay, pay buy, you might see a pair of shoes in a shop window for, 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 for a tenner. You know, would you really buy a pair of shoes for a tenner? Really? And because your perception is going to be, well, that can't be any good. Um, so don't get too hung up on being perceived as necessarily expensive if you because you're not if you're if you can quantify if you can communicate the value that you bring when it comes down to it always seems to come down to price we think it comes down to price uh, and, and why do we think that because many people are in a business where they're cold they're asking for the business so the, the customer will say well what's your best practice 
Um, or XYZ Limited will do it for 10% less. And because we hear those things, we think that price is the priority, that price is the issue, just because we're asked those things. I ask those kind of questions all the time whenever I'm a customer. Um, uh, more recently, I've, you know, this summer we bought um, a patio set, which, you know, one of those wicker type patio sets with the corner sofa and the table and all the rest of it. And um, I'd been on the uh, been on the internet having a look at what I might be expect to pay for pay for one, what I perceived to be a decent one uh, that we did what we wanted it, it to do, and um, then I went out to I, it. Turns out that one of the people's company selling it was about eight miles from my home. So I got in the car, me and my wife, and went to have a look at it. And uh, yeah, there it was. We looked. Yeah, that's the quality. Yeah, she's pretty good. Yeah. So then I went to the salesperson and said, "Did that that." Um, had your set over there. Um, you've got a price ticket on that two thousand pound. And they said, "Yeah." And I said, uh, "Well, I've seen the same thing on the net for seventeen hundred and fifty pound." So I said, "What's your best price?" I said, "Okay, I have it." Um, but because you never know, because people will often say, "What's your best price?" Just to see if you can get ten percent off or whatever. Yeah. Um, but Here's my point. Time and time and time and time again, research will tell you that 25% of prospects in B2B, mm. 25% of prospects see price as the issue. Mm. That means 75%, three out of four, don't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we've got to recognize that time and time and time again. Research also tells us that there are many, many, many more sellers than buyers. That see price as the issue. Mm. Very often, we as sellers make price the issue, sometimes in trying to secure the business from a client because they've already got a supplier. And we we try and get in with the client, if you like, by saying, well, we, we'll do it for 10% less. Mm. And we instantly make price the issue. Yeah. And then we're disappointed maybe next time when they don't buy again from us because they bought, they bought it cheaper from somewhere else. But that's how we often get the business in the first place, by selling on price. If you get sold on price, you're going to lose it on price at some point, almost certain. Mm. Yeah. No, so always, always an issue. But most of the time, it is not the issue. It is our lack of skill in being able to create communicate and sell the value of our product or service that results in the customer saying well what's your best price then? yeah perfect and i would also say that you get this a lot more in service industries than you do in product industries if you're a b2b service people always seem to think you're more negotiable on your price um, and the way we found to avoid that conversation was to actually anchor to the outcome that they're looking to achieve. Um, so if someone wants to increase revenue by a million pounds next year, you know, the price shouldn't come into it. It should be how much do I need to invest in marketing and sales to get to that figure. Um, and once they're looking at it as an investment rather than a cost, it's a very different conversation. Um, yeah. So again, you know, I think I, I hear this a lot from recruitment companies, you know, that they, they get into this downward spiral of just competing against pi price about everybody else. Um, and it's a very price driven. Industry. Yeah, so many do. And again, if, perhaps a useful tip for people listening who do have this problem. And again, as a standalone thing, it's not going to be as effective as having a, a proper effective sales process. Um, but if, if you get asked the question, what's your best price? There's a good chance that you haven't communicated the value. That's the first thing you've got to be listening to. They don't actually say that, but that's probably what they're saying. I'm not, I'm not convinced of the value here, so how much do you want of this? Um, one of the, what, what you could do, one, the way you could respond to that is simply by saying, can I just ask you a question before, before answering it? Can I just ask you, Mr. Prospect, is price your only priority? Mm. And if they say yes, well, then you can make a decision. Do I want to deal with someone whose only priority is price? Uh, and if they say, well, well, no, it's not. OK, fine. What else is going to be important? What else is a priority to you in making this purchase? Uh, and then guess what? They start to tell you other things that are important to them in making the purchase. And that's gold to you as a seller. Absolutely. And yeah. no, you're having a very different conversation at that point. Mm hmm. 
Mm. You know, the fact that you've simply asked what, okay, what, what, what else is important? What are your other priorities in making this purchase? And they start to tell you those things. That's a very different conversation when we're saying, well, it depends on how much you want to buy. And we'll give you 10% off if you buy a lot of it. You're having a very different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you 10% cheaper, but we'll do 10% less work. And so you'll get 10% less result. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I love that. Thank you for answering those questions so thoroughly as well, Austin. No, you're um, welcome. I hope everyone's taken a deep breath now. What I recommend everyone does is watch this through two or three times because I think Austin has just dropped some real gold in there um, that's going to help you with your own sales processes. How do they get in touch with you, Austin? Just talk through how, how you work with people like business owners or sales teams. What's your process for working with people and helping them improve? Um, they're basically, there's three ways that I, I, I can work with companies. One, if you've got a sales team that is made up of six or more people, um, and if you want to enhance their skills, then it's perhaps worth uh, talking to me. Um, two, if you don't have a sales team of six people, maybe you're the only person selling in, in the business or you've got one salesperson. I run an open workshop um, twice a year for a maximum of 12 people. Um, so you can always contact me about that if you're just a, a lonely salesperson or business owner, if you will. Uh, and the third way is one-to-one -one coaching. If you'd prefer it to be one-to-one -one coaching, then I'm perfectly happy. And you can reach me via my website, austinempson.com, or you can always find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Amazing. Well, thanks for your time today, man. That's been really interesting. I think you've covered so many areas that people worry about, so many, you know, I say we've never had as many questions come in for a live show as this one. So just shows you how how front of mind it is to people just to improve this. Well, I really hope we brought some value. I hope some of the, the content people can take away and they've, they've got an idea, something they can use that will make them just a little bit more effective. I'm Richard. I appreciate it. And um, to everybody watching, because I might never come into contact with you, happy Christmas. Am I the first person to wish happy Christmas? <laughs> You've just beaten me, yeah. <laughs> just... <laughs> Lovely. Right. Well, I'll talk to you soon, mate, and uh, thanks for that. Right. So we've got uh, – I hope all of that was useful. Put it into action. As I say, watch these videos through again. Make sure you, you're really making notes on, on what was talked about in there because I think there's some real – pointers that Austin's given you there that can really improve how you convert those leads into customers and revenue. So work on that. Um, this is our last show of the year, as we said. Uh, the next show we've got coming up is going to be the 19th of January. Uh, I've already started building that out. It's going to be five steps to growing a seven-figure business in 2022. So we're going to cover all of the key elements that you need to have in place uh, to move from wherever you are now towards that million pound business or if you're at that seven figure business how to improve that so i'll be sharing a lot of insight on that um in in january uh, but in the meantime as austin's just said if there's anything you want before then just get in touch with us any questions you want answering in january just send them in as always to support at digitalmediaedge.co.uk or dm them through to me on linkedin and we'll make sure they're in that show as well and I just want to wish you a happy Christmas as well, everybody who's been watching the show, especially everyone who's been with us since February. And um, we've had a lot of people coming up to every show, um, really engaging, sending questions in. And that's really what we wanted to do when we first thought about running these shows. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, after Christmas and uh, getting ready for a good 2022. Take care. Bye now.